It is my privilege that we can continue our study in the book of Revelation. The theme of today's study is the seven trumpets. Now, for this to study, we would need a lot of more time than just a few minutes. And it is a real challenge, because if you look to all those interpretations that are around there, and I was curious to see, not as an orientation, but just to see what is there. And uh, then I found different types all try to explain things. And what I saw and what was for me um, most important is, do I understand the purpose? Because if I don't have a purpose for something, I cannot figure out why they are there. And usually I see that we do not ask these questions before we study things. What's the purpose? And you see that we found in our book of Revelation that the purpose of the book of Revelation is set clear. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we will never leave it out of our minds when we study this book. It must be fulfilled in a certain time. The ultimate goal is the light to the whole world. That what must be realized in our time. And the church, it's not a book that is to be revealed. It's the church that has to reveal Christ. And they must use the resource, the blood of Christ, his life, to be theirs. And they will all do this by taking from the source of all things, which is our Heavenly Father, who is love and righteousness. So let us see that we have seven churches with seven seals and seven trumpets. And we look to the same timeline as we have said already before. We have the first coming, the second, and the third coming. And from the beginning, there we have the church of God. Christ established his church with his 12 apostles. And the purpose is that they should reach the world in order to restore them. But the church must, of course, be restored first so that they can give the message. And so Christ gave his disciples and they started in seven periods of time to come until today. And we saw that their spiritual state is declining even in the first church. They lost a little bit of their first love. There were few that didn't do that. So we had a remnant always. In Smyrna we don't have a remnant because the church is quite clear. Then in Pergamon it starts degrading and you have a small remnant always. But you see the church goes up and down. And in the end God must reach its goal that he started it 2,000 years before. And so we saw that the seven seals are those who bring the message. And they go forth with the horses, went forth conquering and to conquer. This is the gospel. This is Christ's message that has to go and went out and it will go to the end. Then comes the red horse and we saw the spiritual famine with the dark horse and the spiritual death as a powerless message. Souls under the altar who cry for God's righteousness. And then we have the judgment seen in the sixth seal. And in the seventh, we have that silence in heaven. And that is our going up from the earth towards the heaven in those seven days, which is a half an hour. And then, of course, follows the millennium for the saints up in heaven and for Satan up down on earth. And then comes the final judgment when Satan is released and all the wicked are resurrected for the final judgment. Now we want to study the trumpets. And this study is, I thought, for me it was most difficult because I know from my childhood the interpretation of the pioneers and somehow 
if I would have not had that interpretation before, if I just would read the Bible and would go by that what I already studied back and forth in the Old and the New Testament, I would not come up with that explanation. And I don't say that I now I found out the way. I believe we must study and must figure the things out. And I went from understanding the purpose. Now, where do you find the purpose in this text box? Where is it written? It must be somewhere uncovered. And so in the seven seals, I mean, we find this purpose in the seven churches. We know they must be restored. The seven seals, they bring it, the, they try and so, show that the someone must finish the work. And they are seals. That means they must come up with the sealing of God's people. So chapter 7 of Revelation is the purpose of the sealing. That is, God must have a people that are his. And they are his restored on earth. We have seen then the difference between the big multitude, all the saved, which are just sealed to not die the second time. But this group must be restored because they must show in their lifetime that Christ is all their character. They have his character and they must not die because they have been finished. Why should they need to die? So that's their privilege. So that's why the ceiling just shows where is the goal of these horses and this cry of the souls and the judgment. And now we must find out where do we find the purpose of the trumpets. And I could only find it in that thing in between. You see, we have in between the sixth and the seventh seal, we have the ceiling. And now we have between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, we have chapter 10 and parts of chapter 11. And then we will find also in the seven plagues, we will have between the sixth and the seventh plague a, a, a part that doesn't belong to the plague itself, but shows like we must see the model, the purpose. Th that's why I found here in chapter 11, the purpose of the ceiling, because it is in the midst. So it must be there and I must figure out why was it written. So, and here in chapter 11, it says, after John saw that, uh, John saw Christ, the angel with the little booklet, and we will come back at the end to see that more closely. But just start from verse 1 from chapter 11 from Revelation. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. Now, if we see the beginning of the seven trumpets, we find exactly the scene is from verse 2, chapter 8. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. We speak about the same altar, then the souls were there under. It's the altar of incense. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer 
and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there was, were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So the introduction of the scene makes sense with that what we find in this thing in between the, the seven seers, which is there was given a rod. And it is very clear what is a rod to measure. For what, what purpose is the measurement of that rod? There must be something. And when we look to the whole Bible, when it comes to measure, it's always judgment. So there must be a judgment that takes place. And who is judged? It's not the heathen. It's not those that are the enemies, like somehow it's explained here the trumpets are a, a intervention of God against his enemies, which I cannot follow Exactly, because here it says it's the people of God that needs to be examined and judged. And so my purpose that I found in the trumpets is it is the measurement of the temple. That means it's the judgment of God's people. And we will see if that all fits together. And, of course, there is here, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I give the power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Now, when did the two witnesses start their witness? Did they start it when... Uh, John saw the, the vision, of course they started it before. Now we have the Old Testament, the New Testament, we have the scripture. And it started in Ephesus. The two witnesses started to bring their message. And by some circumstances, we will see later on when we come to see what that meant, the messengers who had this straight message of the gospel, the two-edged sword, yes, the two-edged sword that either heals or saves or destroys. That means if all are born in darkness, then if the gospel is rejected, you remain there. But the difference is that now you have responsibility because by irrationality, someone was rejecting light and reason. And so God says, well, I gave you all the means to become different. You wanted to stay like this, so now you're responsible. So the gospel, the two witnesses are powerful witnesses. And when you read there, we have not the time to read but you can study and you see how they are described, which, what a power they have to save or to kill. So it is, they are those two, um, as we, we can read it, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And here it cites from Zechariah, where we have this picture of the two uh, olive trees and the candlesticks standing and what do they represent of course they represent the power the olive the oil the holy spirit and of course the the light yes that brings to uh, to in goes into the darkness so god sends all his power through his spirit and brings light to the world. So these two messengers are there. And of course they, they are not just the books. That's not just the Bible. The Old and the New Testament. Someone needs to bear the message. And we know who bears the message. 
it's the church of God. And in the um, white horse, we also see what the message is. But now in this dark time of church history, then the message is from 538 to the end of the days in 798, they have to bring their witness in sackcloth, like they are not in that power that was given to them. And it even comes to the point where they are killed. And we know that from history. Uh, right after this um, time of the end between 538 and 1798, where in the French Revolution, the Bible was uh, burned on the streets and it was forbidden them for three and a half years, like the prophecy says it is. So, but then they rise from the dead. That's how it's described. And they go with the same power? Yes, even with a greater power. And why are they called witness? Because they are the witnesses in the judgment. You see, the language is used. If it's about judgment, we have to speak about witness. And now Laodicea is the judge church. That's why Jesus says himself, I am the true witness. Because it's a judgment setting. That's why the trumpet are a judgment. And I cannot see that they are a judgment of the evil one first. Because all judgment, when we go through the Bible, cannot start with the heathen. It must start with the people of God. And so now of course we could go and put all the the things here in this time period of uh, the trumpets in in this in this times there, but there is a few things that will come and disturb me if I do that. So I put the trumpets in the judgment setting, and since the judgment is starting from 1844. The trumpets must come beyond that. Now I understand when the pioneers uh, studied prophecy in the 1800s, when they came across all those things, they put and had to put the seven trumpets in the past since they were awaiting Jesus to come in a few months. And of course, they're waiting Jesus to come in their lifetime, so they could not bring anything in their interpretation that go beyond 1844. So first it was 1843, and then it was 22 October 1844. And so, and somehow it fits, and it might be some people believe in double interpretation. Me personally, I'm not inclined to that. Uh, but it might be, I'm not the measurement in this place, but I would like to share the meaning that I think they have for us today, the trumpets. So we look to the picture, the measurement of the temple, we see it is measured, we see the measurement up here, and it is only measured the people of God, because only they entered into the temple. They were allowed to enter the temple. It was not allowed that Gentiles should enter beyond that certain place in the courtyard of the sanctuary or the temple. I put here the sanctuary, but the same thing. We just must know something is out there for the Gentiles. And the people of God are the one that are measured in the temple. And do they really need to be measured? I mean, if the people of God, whoever once confessed Christ, and I will say this is non, not a denominational thing, it's everyone that comes to Christ, even those who are 
born again, but we will see that even if someone is born again, he might not make it. Because the new birth is no guarantee that you grow. And we have here in in when we will see a little bit later how Jesus describes those things that there must be bearing fruit. But if we look today to those professed people of God, are they in the right shape today to do and fulfill God's purpose that he describes in Revelation? Are they there that when he says to them now, let's start, do the job, are they ready to do it? Or are they in a terrible, dark place, in a terrible apostasy, believing things are ignorant of reality? If I look around myself, I see the same darkness, the same unknowledge that we can find at the beginning when Jesus came on the earth, when he found his people in total. Uh, yes, they were totally departed from God. They were searching the scripture, Jesus says in John 5, but they were not receiving him. So how could that be? He was the fulfilling of the scripture. Because their minds were darkened. They had narrowed down their minds. And religion and all ideologies go not away to open up our minds. We just get narrowed down. And this is not the purpose of God. God's people need to grow. They get to get wide-minded. And in that widening, there is no contradiction to that what you once learned. If it's a contradiction, then something is wrong. So the people of God today are not ready to fulfill the job. And so God must measure them. And the only way to measure them is through judgments. You see, Laodicea, we have seen, is poor, miserable, and naked. And all those five things. And Jesus comes and says, I offer you to buy from me gold tried in the fire, white clothes, and I self that you see. But if you see everything, you don't need, if you have your own righteousness, you don't need the righteousness of Christ or you just misunderstand it. And so, how can he intervene? And we find that in the seventh church that he says, him who I love, I rebuke and chasten. And this is judgment. This is sifting. This is sealing. This is, this is preparing a people who is able to give the message. God was again and again in the history of this earth, so to say in human language, disappointed because his people didn't do the job why he was called them to do. They got apostatized. They went away. So if God wants to finish what he has in his mind to finish, then he must make a work of separation in his people. And so we find that the work of separation was in the past, and I believe it will be also in the future, according to a pattern that God used. So we find in Zechariah, I read first Zechariah chapter 13, and there we find an interesting thing. On the beginning on the chapter, it says, in that day... And we know that's the judgment day. There shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. So there is a remedy there to make them clean. So that's the introduction of the chapter. And I just go to the, to, to the uh, verse 7. 
Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, says the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. So we know this is a prophecy that Jesus uses about himself. He said, the sword will come and kill me, and if you smite a shepherd, what will happen with the sheep? But it is a continuing in this promise, says the Lord, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. That is, I go toward those who have remained over from the coming of the sword. You see, when, when Jesus was uh, crucified, his disciples had to be trained to not be sifted through. And that's why he trained them, and a year and a half before, he, he brought judgment while saying there in John 6, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you are going to not eat the manna. And then they said, come and eat. And he invited them and said, if you eat my uh, uh, flesh and drink my blood, you will not live for you anymore, but you will live for me like I live for the Father's sake. And they separated. He separated through the message. The 70 disciples, they went away. Now imagine... The 70 disciples would have been with this, with this 12 disciples when Jesus was crucified. And when in that sudden situation, they went off. So God must, before he brings that final sifting, which I believe is only then when his people is ready, he must prepare them. Jesus knew even though they would be disappointed, like the one was disappointed in the, in the first Advent movement, they will not give up. That remnant, those few people, and we'll see how a big difference was it when they started and how many remained. So Jesus prepared his disciples so that they should not fall when the shepherd is smitten with this word. And he will turn to that little, my hand upon the little ones, that is, those little people who have remained into the flock. So the disciples overcame that sifting, that judgment, because Jesus prepared them and he, he sifted out the 70 disciples who were in their heart not really bound to Jesus. Even though they, he accepted them as disciples, they went and did miracles, they healed, but when they left him, they left him forever. So, in Zechariah, we read further on, and it shall come to pass that in all the land, and the, all the land is Israel, or is the church, or the, the, the people of God, says the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die. So, two parts fall right away. They even come into the closer sifting. And we will see that it always was in the past. That's why I take the past, the pattern. For me, God is working in patterns so that we can understand it. So that what the Bible says, that what was will come again, and there is nothing new under heaven. So we just want to learn the pattern. For thus, for our time. So two-thirds fall away. So right away. And if we take just the disciples, the 12 and the 70, and you made the ratio, you see that how many are just cut off right away. Right away. But the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried, and they shall call on my name, and you will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. So, isn't that interesting? The third 
is not yet ready. It must be cleansed and it is divided into lost and righteous ones. And so the righteous ones are also two parts, leaders and helpers. But since this is not only with Zechariah and is not written for our time, I mean it's written for our time at the end, we go back and read Ezekiel chapter 5. Now Ezekiel is very, very similar to Revelation and they will find a lot of uh, things there. Ezekiel 5. And in Ezekiel 5, it's the same thing. The church of God, the people of God are fallen apart. And now judgment comes over them. And I read here from verse 1, chapter 5. And those son of man, take thee a sharp knife, take thee a barber's razor, and cause it to pass upon thine head and upon thy beard. Then take the balances to weigh and divide the hair. So you must have had some hair to uh, cut it down and then divide it. Thou shalt burn with fire a third part in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are fulfilled. So he had to burn the first part right away. And thou shalt take a third part and smite about it with a knife. And the third part shalt scatter in the wind and I will draw out a sword after them. So we have three parts. And you go also that one part dies away, the second, and then the third. And look how God makes it. Thou shalt also take thereof a few in number. So that's from the third part. He takes a few in number and binds them into thy skirts. And also from this few numbers, then take of them again and cast them into the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire, for thereof shall a fire come forth into all the house of Israel. Now this is different than he, buy, he, he burns the other one. So we must understand the symbols. And for me, it's, it's beautiful that remnant is that which is sifted out, that which is found good. But among them, there are the leaders, and I think the leaders are them that are put in the midst of the fire, for thereof shall a fire come forth into all the houses. This is a, a fire of, of life, of bringing the light, because they are tried in the fire, and they just now shine. So I would say this are the 144,000. These are the sealed from those who remain from that, that sifting of that third part. Two, three parts, two thirds are left, it's gone. And even if we look to the parable of Jesus, his first parable about the seaman, the sower, went forth to, to saw the grain. And we find there are four grounds. The first ground is the 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 way where it's hard and the birds come and pick away. So this is not God's people. But we find that the third ground, the, the second ground with the stony ground and then the, the, um, with the tears and then we find the good ground. So if we take this three as a whole, we have three times a third. These are the whole who are, so to say, they get and they become born again. And they grow, but they don't finish the growth. Two-thirds of them fall right away apart. Only one-third brings fruit. So you see, that's why I was wondering why in the trumpets it's always speaking about a third. Now, some people say, well, it's just a part of it. But no, the whole church, the whole the people of God must be judged. But you see, two-thirds are just sifted out. They don't even come into the, the, 
the thing to think that they will be fine, faithful. So here, for me, the trumpets are the cleansing of the third of the people. And I go through them just very fast because we are the time is all run away. The first trumpet is the tribulation and persecution that comes upon that third of the people and the people are the grass and the people are the trees. And they come down the hailstone and they put them under tribulation and persecution. And those who are cleansed are cleansed and those who are not cleansed are left out. And then there is this big mountain that is put into the the ocean, and some people believe that's a real meteorite that comes and kills a third part of the, the ships and uh, the fishes, and the third part becomes blood. No. When we see again in Ezekiel, when it says, say, lift up thy sword against the mountain. So a mountain is the place where the people brought their their they're idols. That was idol worshipping. Then God says, I go against mountain. It was not the mountain that's the problem. So he put that mountain into a war and says it must be cleansed. The people that are somehow worshipping somewhere, they must, through war and bloodshed, get away from it or not. And then the one that comes to that makes the water bitter or poisoned. Who else is this? As the false teachings. And through false teaching, God is sifting. People who go after false teaching, somewhere they don't have the ground set well. And so that's why God uses even the false teachings to cleanse his church. Because he who picks up the false teachings will die. And that happens in this third trumpet. And then, of course, sun, moon, and stars, what are they? We find again in the dream of Joseph. They are the leaders, the father, mother, and the brothers. So here we find that the leaders are in total ignorance in spiritual darkness, and they must be also cleansed. And it is just a third that is there because the other already fall apart. So here it comes that Christ wants to cleanse leaders and the people. Those are the two groups that enter into this cleansing process. That's why I believe it's always said a third part, a third part. If not, I, I could not figure out anything else better. Maybe some people know it better. But for these four things, they are very symbolistic and they come uh, across and it's clear, it's not a big thing. But now we come to the fifth and there it becomes a little bit more difficult. Now there comes that angel and that eagle that flies in the midst of heaven and says, there are two woe, three woes that come upon the earth. Woes are terrible things. And so in we find that, and that was bringing me, I couldn't go over that, this fifth um, uh, uh, seal, which just says something that uh, was making me, bring me a lot of, of thought issues comparing it with the 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 pioneers understanding so we know the fifth i don't read everyone everything then but from verse 5 chapter 9 and to them it was given that they should not kill them but that they should be tormented five months and the torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man but i want to read verse 4 and it was commanded them this this uh locusts that look like scorpions and so on, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. So now here, this cannot be the people. Because people are counted here as being the people. And so, it's just this 
because locusts usually go and eat from the grass and eat from those green things. But here, they are not for that there because they have to hurt only, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, supposedly, we could say this means that the, the people that were sealed and have the seal of God must be present. Because why should there be a division? Why should they only determine those humans that have um, not the seal? So obviously, in the fifth uh, thing, in the fifth trumpet, there is a clear separation between the cleansed, the sealed, and the lost. So we find that here, and I put this after the end of probation, I just from how I would understand it, because we find certain patterns again that we have here people that are in deep remorse. They want to die, but they cannot, but they do not convert. And not, neither in the sixth, they do not convert. So the second and third woe comes upon people, even though it's the hardest thing. They get their remorse, they understand that they did wrong, but they do not convert. When you go through this, uh, fifth, you see that's a, a, a total different type of a trumpet like what the, the ones before. And it looks, it is just a spiritual thing that goes on in the minds of these people because the scorpions and the, 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 the tails that they have, we find also in the Bible and in the, uh, in, in the Revelation, we find that's the power of the devil by deception to work. And though they were deceived and they find themselves as deceived, they see that they are deceived and they see that they follow the wrong preachers and so on, but they still do not convert. Now, some people might come and say, well, how do you know that's about the seal of God in their foreheads? Now, would you ever think it's not about those sealed in chapter 7? Would I just try to find another group that is sealed here in this context? For me, then the fifth uh, uh, trumpet must come when we have the sealed already sealed. So it must be in that last part of world's history. And of course, when I see this trumpets, I would love to believe they have already passed and we are between the 6th and the 7th. But according to the text, we find here that there is a division between the sealed people and not sealed. And I cannot think on other sealed people here than those 144,000. Now, this is why they cannot even, they have in deep remorse, they search for to die, but they cannot die because they are in this great distress. And since it's very literal here, I find even the five months might be very literal. It's there, a deep remorse, it's a fight that you have in your mind and then it cannot be 100 for 50 years at taking the... Yeah, because the sealed one won't live 150 years. That's just a very short period of time. The end of probation comes very, very close time. And then we come to the sixth trumpet, which is releasing the four winds from Euphrates. And I cannot understand something else. Then that happens in the seven plagues. And then a third of the lost die. The, the sealed don't die. And the other ones, under this great plague, which is a war, which is, which is really uh, there, a fighting, and we saw there is uh, big, big uh, rumors of big war going on there with, with horses, men, and, and all this, 
and he heard the number of them. So there is a big war going on in those days. And a third of them are dying. It's not all, but a third of people from the earth will be a very great number. And then, of course, mm -hmm. comes the seventh trumpet, which is the completion of the just. Why are the just only then completed? Because we find in chapter 10, and uh, we will soon read that, but in the days of the voice of the seven angels, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. So what's that mystery? It's the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul declares it clear. These people have went not only till the end of probation, they have not been found worthy, they were sealed, but they now went through that fire, to that time of trouble that no one could ever go except he was sealed and he would not be killed. And they are completed in the seventh trumpet. God opens up heaven. And we will see the ark is seen, the law is seen in heaven. And God makes his covenant with his saved people, which are the 144,000. So that's the completion, the, the perfection of the saints. They were perfect before they entered the, the end, uh, before they entered the time of probation, the seven last plagues, but they were not yet complete. They were sinless. But they have to go to be able to sing that song of Moses and the Lamb. They have to go through that terrible proof that they are worthy. That they have cleansed their robes in the blood of Christ perfectly. And not even that. Their faith is stronger than that faith that Adam had in Eden. It's that faith of Jesus that conquered the evil one. And this is the completion of his people. That's why we look forward. The judgment shows on the completion of the judge, but the just. But at the same time, it brings judgment of the wicked. How many people die? All people on earth die, except the 144,000 and those that those saints that God raises just when he makes the 144,000 free and they come up out in a glorified body, never to have any stress. Some, some people believe they will then be stressed uh, because there are still a little bit of a few days until Jesus comes. But no, they come up glorified and the 144,000 are, are in and shrouded with the, with the uh, rainbow. No one can touch them. It, they even, the heath and the fallen people worship on them. So that's the end. But and at the same time, Jesus had to treat, to tread the, the, the task of the wine press. He, that's the judgment of the wicked. When he returns, he must do that strange, terrible work at the end of the time. So the seventh, uh, the seventh seal reveals the judgment of God. That's why you see the Ark of the Covenant. You see there is the law in it. By it, everyone is judged. So let's look to this last part and finish the open book. And you know, this is a very nice intervention because it shows here and it fits very well to the time of judgment and the time of sifting. So what is the open book? We all know it's the discovering of Daniel and the gospel, that time of the Millerite movement and before when they all came and studied the book and saw that Jesus is coming soon. Yes, they bore a message 
There is no time anymore. That was their message. And that's the message. The time of the end was come. Jesus said it because he is the one that has this open book. And he says, there is no time anymore. That means the commission must be fulfilled now. That's when it says there is no time. And here he says, go and eat that book so it's for sure that things must happen and the things which are therein there should be time no longer and the voice which i heard verse 8 from heaven speak unto me again and said go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth and i went unto the angel and said unto him give me the little book and he said unto me Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So here comes that vision that this is the end time yes when daniel was discovered they found a wonderful message a sweet message it was a message of repentance a message that their dreams of the coming of jesus would be fulfilled but it was also a difficult condition to proclaim it we know how the the things didn't go smooth in those days as well but even though they went through that process when a lot of people were sifted out they also had to be sifted before jesus would come so here what is the bitterness because we find that even ezekiel had to eat the book and jeremiah had to eat and we find this picture again and again that to eat the book is to make it your own message we must eat the Bible. It must be our food, but not for us, but in order to be able to give it, to, to share the message. And they shared it. And there were about 50,000 that were waiting in America on that 22 second, 22 of October, 1844. And when they were disappointed that Jesus did not come, 50 remained. You see... The disciples were disappointed, but none of them, Judas already was never a disciple, but those 11, they all remained. So is that the, you see, 50,000 and only 50 remains. That's a serious thing. Now, these were the ones that brought the message forward. I would say these are the five foolish virgins. There are many. And when they are tried, they lack the oil. They lack that. And we know that Jesus said this parable exactly for this midnight cry. Exactly for this time. Only 50 remained faithful. They said, yes, we did not see things the right way. And they were able to correct themselves. And so they were picking up and they did just that, what John here in, in their state makes. They was preaching, most continue to the end of probation. And so now we are here, very close to the end of probation. And the gospel must be preached. And there are many preachers today, but they must be sifted. That means they must be cleansed. We cannot call today people into our midst. Or just imagine you call a person to you at home and he should live with you and see how you live. Would he give you that sign? Is this, you're ready for heaven. Because I saw in your home the love of God. I saw in your home the beauty of patience. I saw in your home the nice words of a man of God. Friends, that must be shown by us, by his children, in the most difficult time. Not when 
you are in leisure or when all things go smooth, then everyone will proclaim, everyone will look like being on Christ's side. But then, when tribulation comes, and it will come, when we are really shaken, when everything is moved, and we are in this time, in this time where God prepares the people, that they may, might stand. And you so say, without affliction, you cannot be cleansed. Without getting into trouble, you cannot be cleansed. Without having enemies, you cannot be cleansed. You must have all those parts there that you should see what is in you. So, do you want to be ready for Jesus? Not only to come, but to be ready to fulfill the, the job. Because that's why we are called. Not for Jesus to wait to come and just save us. No, no. We are ready to proclaim the message. And go through that terrible time. Because we must preach and continue the work. So, this is what I thought with the trumpets present to us. It is just what I came across by all taking that. But of course I'm open. I'm still not 100% that it is so. I'm, I'm a student and I never studied so much like in the last five days. I woke up in the night at four o'clock and I could not sleep again because I had to figure out how things work. And this is what I understood. And I hope that we understand the message of the trumpets. God needs a clean people before he can judge the heathen. Because before the out court comes, the outer court comes, he must have a people that are pure, that he can put in front of everyone, and they will sign and say, these are people that are ready for heaven, because we see the love of God, the patience of the saints, and we see that they have the faith of Jesus. So let's go to work and be ready and cooperate today with Christ in everything so that when that real shaking comes, when that third part will be put to the utmost stress, we might be found worthy. We might be found totally committed. We might be found that nothing is in our heart except Christ. We might be found that we do not search earthly things. We have not anything on this earth that makes us happy. We are searching our home place and we are searching to fulfill that great desire of our Father to see the world saved, to see the light shine through humanity. May God help us to be among those who are sealed and proclaim the message of this last time. Amen.